<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm I'm assuming that we have uh, the presentation started, and I see a large number of participants are of the, um, joining online. So <clears throat> I welcome uh, everyone. This is uh, John McLaughlin speaking. I'll serve as the moderator of this uh, webinar. Um, I'm the uh, professor of epidemiology at Dalalana School of Public Health and also the executive director of the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health, uh, formerly known as the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow Project, which we'll hear a, a bit more about in this seminar, whereby <clears throat> the role of population cohorts for COVID research uh, will be explored. So I welcome um, all of you to today's webinar which is uh, presented um, through the Dalalana School of Public Health. And um, um, a couple of small housekeeping uh, things before we get started. Uh, you will see as participants that the Q&A box is open at the, uh, at the bottom of the screen. So if you do have any questions, you can log them in there and we'll come to questions at the, the end of the, um, the, the presentations. Um, <clears throat> If there are other points of information you would like to explore, we also welcome emails uh, through info at canpath.ca. And then also there's a Twitter handle you can connect with uh, CanPath as well, which is at we are CanPath. Um, so I'd also like to start today's uh, presentation with uh, an acknowledgement that uh, we're located at the University of Toronto on the traditional lands of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Wandat, Huron, and Haudenosaunee Indigenous peoples, and we thank them for allowing us to reside as settlers on their traditional territories. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We uh, acknowledge our presence here and are grateful for the opportunity to um, uh, work here and uh, with you in this way. Um, the speaker uh, presentations today will start with Dr. Philip Awadala, uh, who is the scientific, the national scientific director for uh, Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health. He'll speak about our project, followed by three discussants, uh, Rebecca Christensen, who is a PhD student in the Dalalana School of Public Health, Dr. Michael Schill, who is the CEO and Senior Scientist of the Institute of Clinical Evaluative Sciences, and Dr. Arjuman Siddiqui, who is the Canada Research Chair in Population Health Equity and an Associate Professor at the um, Dalalana School of Public Health. Um, I point uh, all of the um, participants to the bios that are located in the actual um, webinar invitation. So with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Philip Abadal to start his presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, John, for that introduction and hello everyone. Um, and thank you for joining uh, me and my panelists uh, today for this uh, uh, largely a presentation about what we're trying to do with the national population cohort in Canada. And we're going to have a discussion after this webinar about some of these activities as they specifically pertain to COVID-19 research. Um, I'm just going to quickly say a little bit about myself. So I'm the National Scientific Director for the CANPATH cohort. You're going to hear a lot about the CANPATH population cohort today and a lot about what how we're applying and utilizing the cohort to understand our, our, or to utilize uh, the, uh, the cohort for COVID-19 research. Um, I'm at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, but I'm also a professor of both uh, the Dalalana and the Department of Molecular Genetics. And I co-lead the activity with John McLaughlin, whom you just uh, heard from, who's doing our introductions. Um, so, oh, just to see how we're gonna move the, the, the slides here. So one of the things that I always start these types of presentations with is an understanding of why, or try to describe why do we, we collect data from the population. And one of the reasons that we, one of the things that we try to emphasize with the types of activities that we do with programs like CanPath or UK Biobank or other major pro activities like that, is that what we're trying to do is capture individuals, 
to some extent before they develop a disease, as well as capture individuals in the population uh, who have developed a disease. And so here are so just some numbers here, if you like, for, for uh, both prevalence and incidence of some major diseases in Canada, including cancers, heart disease, and COPD. And one of the things that we try to do with these population cohorts is try to understand the why. Why do certain people develop these conditions? What are the comorbidities? Well, can we identify risk factors before people develop a disease? And if in identifying those risk factors, maybe we can be more aggressive about prevention of disease. So we are a large scale population cohort in CanPath. Um, and you're going to hear a lot, about, a lot more about what we've captured across Canada. And the one thing we want to emphasize is one of the reasons we can do this work where we're trying to capture information before people develop disease is because we're a longitudinal population cohort. We have consented a large number of individuals um, such that we're allowed to recontact these participants since they first come into the cohort or what we call baseline. And we have a number of mechanisms by which we can follow up these participants in terms of health, uh, diseases, treatments, and so on. One way is through, the, is through a direct contact. And another way is through, uh, through doing things like linkages through administrative health records. And you're going to be hearing more about that through this presentation and also from our panelists today. So we have the mandate, if you like, to follow the Ken Path or the Canadian Population Cohort uh, for an awful long time. And in some of our regions, we can do this for as long as 50 years. So CanPath Can is a population health research platform. Uh, we have not only consent, but we have uh, a mandate, if you like, to study a broad range of factors associated with health, um, whether it's for genetics, whether it's population epidemiological studies, understanding behavior, and so on. Uh, so presently, uh, we have uh, 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 activities happening right now in nine of Canada's 10 provinces. They are broken up into six cohorts. Um, we have thus far recruited 330,000 participants around the, uh, among these nine provinces. Uh, this baseline of 330,000 participants will continue to grow as we continue to incre increase our baseline. Right now, baseline is, uh, is happening in terms of recruitment in Manitoba. And uh, we have activities happening now to develop our last cohort, uh, 10th province in Saskatchewan. And so by uh, hopefully in the next year or two, we will have representation from all provinces across Canada. And you see in the right in this slide as well, the kinds of things that we try to capture from these participants include things like physical measures, uh, health information, biologics from our participants. Uh, we do longitudinal follow-up, as I mentioned before. And from the biologics, we try to do things like genomics as well. So you're gonna be hearing a little bit more about these in greater detail in a moment. Um, one thing we want to highlight is that CanPath is now in this new mode, if you like, of scientific development. Uh, we spent an awful long time developing the baseline, developing the cohort. A lot of activity was, has been in the operational phase of development. Now we're moving into that scientific phase. And this just gives you a timeline, if you like, of that activity, so on. So if you like, the first participant was, uh, was captured not long after 2008, and most of our baseline has been captured already. And as I mentioned before, we are still recruiting new participants, but we're also mostly spending our time following these participants and doing the science now of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the activity, if you like. So we've captured a lot of information. Now we're really trying to understand uh, how we can best use this information to understand the types of things I had mentioned before. Um, CanPath, if you like, is a partnership um, uh, of uh, seven cohorts. When we're, as I mentioned before, Saskatchewan is currently in development. This slide here is just describing this partnership. Um, so uh, BC Generations is handling things from the far west coast. Alberta Tomorrow Project is, is in charge of activities within Alberta. Cancer Care Manitoba is in mid-recruitment now for the Manitoba Project for participants there. The Ontario Health Study, I also lead the Ontario Health Study out of the OICR, uh, is, act, is, uh, is supporting activities in Ontario. And the Atlantic Path actually has the, um, the, the job of supporting activities for four provinces uh, on the East Coast. And of course, I, I, I just skipped over by accident Quebec, uh, which is being, is being supported by the activity Cartagen. 
These are our directors. Um, so I'm the National Scientific Director, and with John, we lead the national activity housed out of the University of Toronto and the Dalalana uh, School of Public Health, where we have our National Coordinating Centre. Trevor Dummer is our National Scientific Co-Director and is also a member of the BC Generations Project. Uh, Parveen Badi uh, is supporting is the director or leader of the BC Generations. Chandra Harman and Jennifer Vina are leading Alberta Tomorrow. Donna Turner is leading the Manitoba Tomorrow Project. Philippe Broet, Simon Gravel, and Guillaume Lett are, uh, are leading the Cartagen activity, and Jason Hicks is leading the Atlantic Path activity. These are the numbers from the different regions. So this gives you a sense of our, of our recruitment. Um, as mentioned, Manitoba is still in mid-recruitment, but here you're getting a sense of our numbers. Uh, 30,000 for most of our provinces, uh, 40,000 uh, in Quebec and Alberta, a much larger number in Ontario. And in general, what this amounts to is almost one in 100 Canadians have consented to this activity, which is a pretty, which is a pretty impressive number or proportion, if you like. Even the program, the All of Us program in the United States, which is targeting a million people, that is not going to be one in 100 people given the U.S. population. It's still a, a, a very uh, it's still a tour de force, um, but it's, it's, it's not capturing the same, if you like, proportions as we have done so far in CANPATH. Um, as I mentioned before, CANPATH is a population cohort that is longitudinal in nature. And because of its longitudinal aspects, we support both retrospective as well as prospective research. Um, because we are following our participants over time, that's that prospective element or arm of our activity. Our retrospective element, if you like, is that activity where we have captured a lot of information from our participants when they first came in. They might have come into the cohort, say, healthy, and have since then developed some sort of condition. And we can capture that information of that development, either through linkages to administrative records um, or through follow-up surveys or questionnaires. And so that's going to be the focus of what I'm going to be largely talking about today. But before we get to that, I'm just going to give you a little bit more baseline information such that if you, the researcher, are interested in coming and utilizing this data, um, uh, you, you know what our holdings are and what we have. CANPATH has captured a lot of information from our participants. Again, we've invited participants to come in, fill out questionnaires, come to a physical assessment center, provide biologics and so on. We've also have consented our participants to perform linkages to administrative health records. We also have other information about say, location where people live at, at a fairly substantial uh, uh, resolution so that we can perform other types of science with res respect to say, environmental linkages and so on. So all of these elements, if you like, build, if you like, together a fairly substantial resource, um, not just in terms of what we've captured directly from a participant, but our ability to reach out and link to other activities. So in a sense, we're larger than the sum of our parts. Uh, very high level, I'm not gonna spend that much time here on this particular slide, because this could take a while, but we've captured blood sample, we've captured biologics, we've invited participants to physical assessment sites. Not all participants were invited to a physical assessment center. From the 330,000 participants, almost 100,000 participants went to a physical assessment center and where these macro measures here in the middle have been captured where people provided things like blood pressure, uh, waist hip circumference, uh, bioimpedance measures. From a much smaller number at the very bottom, you can see on this, on this slide here, imaging and MRI data is now also available for about almost 10,000, about eight to 10,000 participants in fact. And we also have the ability to do linkages for capturing information associated with environment or exposures. Um, just want to say really quickly with respect to this slide, this gives you a sense of the physical measures. All of this information can be captured if you're interested from contacting CANPATH in terms of how we capture some of the physical measures. Similarly for bi biologics, if you're interested in what biologics we have stored in the biobanks across Canada, um, this gives you a sense of what is now stored. We've got about 160,000 participants who have provided a, some sort of biologic that we can use for genomics, if you like. We say DNA source material, but that could also be extended to supporting transcriptomics, epigenomics. We have projects which are exploiting this material for single cell studies, which is really quite fascinating, in fact. And um, we have urine samples and so on. 
We have genotyping that's being captured right now. Uh, this is growing. We're at around 30,000 participants. We're hoping by the end of this fiscal, um, we had a bit of a delay due to COVID for um, uh, that we'll have genotyping hopefully for about 50,000 participants by the end of this fiscal. This just gives you a kind of a breakdown of who's been genotyped where um, at a three digit postal code resolution, if you like. We also have other types of information that we can make available to, uh, to research scientists about that we've captured from, say, surveys. So this is a very quick slide, if you like, summarizing, say, a question that would be answered by our participants about, say, their perception of health in CANPATH cohort. And also captured from surveys would be information about um, prevalence of diseases. So you can see here, for example, 30,000 of the CANPATH participants at the time of registration or recruitment into the cohort had been diagnosed with the cancer. Those participants have, that, that number has grown with time because the number of part these participants, this cohort, 330,000, is aging and they are developing other chronic diseases, including cancers as well. There's a, uh, there's a citation here listed. So much of what I've just described in the baseline in terms of what we've been capturing has, is, 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 is in this marker paper that was published in the Canadian Medical uh, CMAJ journal uh, two years ago now. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're doing follow-up surveys. 120,000 participants have so far uh, uh, provided us with follow-up questionnaires where we're capturing this type of information about anthropometrics, for example, health status, medical history, behaviors, which I think is our most uh, if you, critical element uh, with regard to the cohort, because this is the kind of information you can only really capture from communicating with participants rather than say capturing from linkages. So one reason why uh, maintaining, if you like, this type of activity is important. Now I've already mentioned our data linkages activities. Uh, so as I've said, we are um, in that place where we can for almost all of our cohorts, I think all, we're 90 to 95% of our participants have consented to allowing us to perform linkages at both the national and provincial level. Um, so that is critical for m much of what our, our research scientists are looking for. They want to have information about, say, a, uh, a participant about, say, for example, if they've developed a cancer. Uh, we support research that's, uh, that's uh, targeting, say, understanding how the built environment, for example, might be impacting your health as well. Um, and this is just a quick summary slide, if you like, of the types of if you like, uh, warehouses of data that we can link to at the provincial level. Um, so you're probably going to be hearing from Michael Schul about the ICES activity, which we support, that which uh, actually has all of the Ontario Health Study now linked within it. Um, and in each one of these provinces, I'm not going to read off all of these uh, different holdings, uh, but each of their provinces has an activity where linkages have been performed for each of the provinces for each participant within that program or cohort. So very recently we've begun activities uh, with the Health Data Research Network, uh, which is a multi-region uh, data linkage activity. Um, HDRN, you're going to hear about from Michael, is a, a CIHR SPORE supported activity, which is if you is effectively trying to build a one-stop shop, for a lack of a better term, for you, the research participant, if you are wanting to make, to have access to information across these provinces with regard to administrative health data. Our ambitions are to link CANPATH uh, with this particular activity such that if you're interested in, in CANPATH data from multiple par uh, provinces, you'll be able to then link not just uh, say in data from say Manitoba alone, but also from Manitoba, Quebec and Ontario with data, administrative data through these provinces. So this is where we're hoping to go with the HDRN and we're gonna leave that for Michael to talk about um, later on during this presentation. Last thing I wanna mention and or highlight is what we're doing in the, with the environmental data. Uh, we're working closely with the canoe activity that's led by Jeff Brooks, who's also at the Dalalana. This is the CANOE program, stands for the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium. CANOE has been doing a fantastic job of collating at a three and six digit postal code all kinds of environmental exposure information um, across Canada. And that includes things like the built environment, residential uh, noise, water, 
air quality, and so on. And so for canoe, for example, you'll be able to, through canoe, for can path, you'll be able to get information about, say, density. Uh, what is the density, uh, urban density or rural density, tree space, and so on, for any participant that has registered in the can path activity. Some of the work we've been doing is looking at how can path, say, densities are actually predictive of obesity, right? And that's, uh, that's all I'm trying to show here with this particular figure as well. CANPATH is part of a large number of activities across the globe, right? And so we're not alone in our size. Um, and there have been a number of consortiums that have been built uh, that have, um, in fact, largely two consortiums that have brought together cohorts that are at least 100,000 in size or, um, in terms of the number of participants. And they also had to fit the bill, if you like, in terms of having captured biologics and the ability to do linkages, right? So I've uh, I've included some of them here. Um, this is one particular initiative called the International 100,000 Cohort Consortium, which I'm uh, part of, uh, uh, of the steering committee for. Um, this is its membership here, and you can see that it's recruited, um, uh, has representation from across the globe. Uh, one of the major activities that I've already mentioned before is the UK Biobank here, but there are other activities within the UK that are also quite substantial in size that have also developed uh, come into this consortium as well. Um, this is just an, if you like, a kind of where, where does CANPATH sit in the Canadian, if you like, environment in terms of its size. So we have 330,000. The other major activity in Canada is, of course, the CLSA, the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, which has recruited about 50,000 participants as well. Um, I want to highlight CHILD, which is more directed towards, um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a family uh, cohort, if you like. They have recruited children as well as parents, and so they are following those uh, children as they develop over time as well. So that is CANPATH. Um, and now what I wanted to focus on for the remainder of my time here is talk a little bit about where CANPATH and other international activities are going to support COVID-specific research. And we launched an, an activity um, in pretty much as soon as uh, the emergencies were declared across the provinces in Canada in March of this year to to, and what we called it, what we called it was the CANPATH COVID-19 initiative. And our hope was to support uh, and leverage the infrastructure that we've built in terms of recruiting 330,000 participants where we've already captured lots of information from our participants um, and use that information to support and understand uh, disease severity, infection, um, um, also support activities that are uh, mapping, if you like, uh, uh, where people are being, being tested, where people are being infected, and who they may be being infected as, by as well. Uh, we're also in our surveys capturing information about socioeconomic impacts and mental health as well as long-term health impact. So the thing I really want to emphasize here is that because we already have captured a lot of information about potential comorbidities and or precursors that may be associated with, say, disease severity, for example, CANPATH's has substantial value, um, if you like, in contributing to understanding the science of disease uh, susceptibility as well as severity. Uh, one thing I want to highlight is CANPATH is a, it's a member of the COVID-19 Host Genetics Initiative. Um, thus far, there are 195 contributing studies across the globe that are contributing to the COVID-19 Host Genetics Program. The COVID-19 Host Genetics Initiative is bringing the human genetics community, there's about a thousand to two thousand, actually last count there might be closer to 1500 researchers, geneticists from across the globe who are part of this initiative, who are trying to utilize some co cohorts like say CANPATH, UK, Biobank, Lifelines in the Holland to understand what the underlying, genetic, uh, underlying genetics of susceptibility may be. Um, one very recent study that's now come out of this consortium was just published in New England Journal of Medicine uh, last week, I believe. Um, and this is a genome-wide association study uh, associated with severe COVID-19 and respiratory failure. Um, this association study here, you can really see that this is just a snapshot of the Manhattan plot here, uh, identifying a number of genes, particularly uh, showing a, an association here for blood type or blood groups and its association with COVID-19 severity. Again, this, is, this was actually largely coming out of uh, cohorts from Northern Italy. I wanna emphasize that as well. And as well as, um, well, Northern Italy and as well as, uh, as Holland as well. Um, and so, yeah, already things uh, are coming together 
what was necessary for this to come together, of course, was having large numbers. The number of, of individuals who are being infected in each one of these cohorts is still sufficiently small, so you need to have these large numbers to be able to capture these associations as well. The other thing that the COVID-19 Host Genetics Initiative has now put together, if you like, is a patient phenotype definition. And if you're interested, all of this is freely available on the COVID-19 Host Genetics Initiative website, if you like. Um, one other activity I wanted to highlight is an activity that I'm helping lead with, follow, uh, with people from um, the Memorial Sloan Kelly, uh, Kettering, Kelly Bolton, and Pradeep Natarajan um, at, uh, at Harvard and the Broad Institute, which is looking at the impact of clo uh, clonal hematopoiesis um, on, on COVID-19 susceptibility as well. Uh, so for those who may be interested in how clonal hematopoiesis may be impacting COVID-19, um, uh, please feel free to contact me and we can discuss um, if you, uh, how you may be able to contribute to this particular activity. CANPATH's COVID-19 questionnaire was launched uh, about a month and a half ago. Um, and the questionnaire itself um, ha was designed to align with those international efforts that I just described a moment ago. So we made a concerted effort to make sure that we harmonized what we're capturing from our participants um, with other major international efforts, right? So we wanted to make sure that we were both being very detailed or at least capturing as, as much information to minimize any sort of miss, if you like, classification of phenotypes but at the same time, we had to also be careful with respect to like how long these surveys became. But one of the challenges we actually had was that these surveys had, were, had to be somewhat dynamic because as we were learning as we went, uh, the things we wanted to capture about COVID, we were just starting beginning to learn um, as we started to understand how the disease was progressing internationally. And so you can see here a pretty nice breakdown, if you like, of the types of information we're capturing, whether you've been tested, any symptoms you may have been experiencing um, both pre-lockdown and during the lockdown, if you've been hospitalized, your current health status, uh, potential sources of exposure, so travel history if you like. Um, and then we also started asking a lot of questions about its impact on your mental health, right? So impact on pet job status, mental, emotional, social, and financial well-being as well. All of this is available. If you like, you can see the survey. It's on the CANPATH website. And uh, if you have questions, you, we can, we're always happy to ask them at, at, at the National Coordinating Center as well. Uh, we've launched uh, about a month and a half ago. Um, thus far across Canada, we've, we've, we've had response uh, from 32,000 people so far. Um, response rates have been remarkable um, uh, compared to some of our other response rates. Uh, the numbers so far for Quebec and Alberta are around 4,000. That's after maybe a week of activity. So pretty impressive in terms of response rates. We're already able to start building out, say, maps like we've got here on the right. So for Ontario, for example, um, you get a sense here of the surveys, the number of individuals. In fact, this is a map, if you like, at a three-digit postal code resolution of those individuals who've said to us in the, in the survey that they've actually received a test for COVID-19. Um, just to zoom in here, and now this is sort of, if you like, uh, just the, what I showed you before was uh, the numbers. This is actually the proportion of the population tested uh, for COVID-19 at that three-digit postal code re resolution. And when I say proportion of population tested, as proportion of population tested of the people that gave us a survey, right? Our numbers for Ontario so far are around three to five percent of the cohort has been tested so far. We're also capturing lots of information about symptoms on average. Um, and this is of course going to, this, this will have a very large range, but on average, uh, four per, uh, we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing from Ontario, um, people reporting four symptoms per individual on average. So that's gonna mean a lot of people reporting no symptoms and a lot of people reporting a lot of symptoms as well. Um, also capturing lots of information as well as I mentioned before about how people are now behaving, right? Uh, social distancing, washing hands, um, avoiding touching their face, 72% are now being more active with respect to that. This is the important, that this wearing a mask in public I think is really interesting as well. I'd be interested to see in our follow-up surveys how this number will change um, in terms of six, right now we're at 62% in Ontario um, it'd be interested to see how those numbers change over time as well. Um, the last uh, set of, uh, slide I wanted to present is uh, the fact that we have now launched across CANPATH 
a program called Support Canada. This is a CIHR funded activity, was just, um, was just uh, awarded a couple of weeks ago um, to support serotyping as well as our surveys, but also serological surveillance of a number of, parti uh, of uh, participants from the CANPATH activity. And we're also working now and having discussions with the Canadian Immunity Task Force and how we can support a national serotyping uh, and immunity uh, studies uh, using the CANPATH activity. Um, so just going to end off this presentation talking about how you can have access to the data and how you can learn more. So this is the CANPATH site. This is uh, how you, this is if you like your first line or first uh, step in terms of getting access to CANPATH data. It's our portal. You can see more information about the cohort data, the biosamples and how you get access. Um, with our friends at the Maelstrom, um, uh, Maelstrom at McGill, uh, we have um, spent an awful lot of time harmonizing all of the data such that when you're asking for CANPATH data, you're asking for effectively a single data set. Maelstrom has been very important in, help, in helping support not just that harmonization activity, but also the portal. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned them as well in our um, in our in, in this webinar and of course this is just in a, a kind of a snapshot of what an access application might look like and very quickly here we're not going to walk you through this but this is our our multi-step approach uh, process for having access to data if you're really interested in data our access approvals our access process is actually much more expedited than say making access for biologics and then we can also discuss uh, for the remainder of this today how you can have access to linkage and information for the participants as well. So big thanks to the National Coordinating Center. Um, so uh, John McLaughlin's here, as I mentioned, he did the introduction and he's our executive director for the, for the, uh, for the CANPATH activity. Um, and uh, Arletta Bax uh, uh, should get a, a big a shout uh, out here for s organizing the, this webinar as well as with uh, Kimberly Skeed uh, in terms of the development of the, uh, the webinar uh, slides that you saw today. So thanks to all of you for paying attention and for listening. Um, we're hoping to hear from you with regard to um, what we have and our data holdings. And I want to just emphasize that while we are a research program, this is a research program for the scientific community at large. So we are a resource to be used and a platform. And we are effectively evaluated by um, you know, your utility. So we want to support your research as much as, um, as, as, much as we can. So uh, we also want to, of course, thanks our, our 330,000 participants who are actively engaged in the cohort and giving us a lot of information um, as we speak, in fact, with regard to uh, COVID-19. So thanks very much. And I think I will turn this over to you, John. Philip, thank you very much. And <clears throat> thanks for uh, going through that uh, story and packing uh, more than a decade's work into a short presentation. We'll turn it over to the discussants uh, first. Um, I see that there are several questions uh, in the Q&A. Please uh, keep those rolling and we'll come back to the Q&A after we hear from the three discussants. We'll start with um, Rebecca Christensen. We're delighted that uh, one of uh, U of T, uh, Dalhousie School of Public Health PhD student, is very interested and experienced with UK uh, with cohort data, uh, and we'll hear about some of her work, her recent work uh, with the UK Biobank. So, Rebecca, over to you. There we go, I had to unmute myself, my apologies. Uh, thank you so much, John, and thank you very much, Philip, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, as John said, I am currently a doctoral student at the Dahl Honor School of Public Health and Epidemiology, and I'm using the UK Biobank for my dissertation work. Uh, the UK Biobank is a very similar resource to CANPATH. It collects a lot of very similar data, so it has objective measures of uh, body weight, uh, waist circumference, it also does genotyping, and all of this is available on approximately 500,000 individuals. Um, they already have a lot of prospective linkages, and because of already having this in place, they were able to act very quickly once the start of the COVID pandemic. In fact, as of April 14th, they made available to all researchers with an existing agreement with them, community and in-hospital-based testing results. And then not last weekend, but the weekend before, they made available to all researchers' death data. 
And they did this with as few barriers as possible to allow for immediate research. So for example, as I already had access to a subset of the data for my dissertation work, I didn't have to do any additional application. I was just given permission to have access to the COVID-19 data. Um, and as Philip already kind of alluded to, one of the big advantages here is that by having a population-based cohort with these objective measures, we're able to get access to certain things that we would not be able to using traditional administrative databases. So this can include some of the behavioral uh, risk factors, so smoking and alcohol use, and also some other measures that as a primary, primarily obesity researcher, I'm more interested in, so things like uh, body mass index and high waist circumference. And so myself and some other researchers from the Dalana School of Public Health were able to look at a very important risk factor that has recently been brought to light for COVID-19, and that's different measures of adiposity. Um, a lot of other research projects in this area that has already looked at this were limited by rather small sample sizes or missing certain measurements, both which we had because we were using such a rich resource as the UK Biobank. And we were able to get approximately 3,000 participants within only about a month of data collection. And because of this, we were also able to look at an important other way of looking at obesity, specifically looking for effect measure modification by one of the other risk factors that have been shown to be very influential in COVID-19, which is AIDS. This does really highlight the advantages of having a population-based cohort in place and linkages in place as we're able to conduct this research and look at something important like effect measure modification very shortly after the start of the pandemic itself. So thank you very much and I look forward to hearing some questions later on. Thank, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, uh, quite remarkable and when you consider the how recent the pandemic is, that's really quite remarkable that you've already been able to generate these uh, data uh, based on the UK Biobank. I'd like to uh, turn it over now to uh, Dr. Michael Schull, who, um, as you've already heard in Philip's comments, uh, we've been collaborating with in terms of uh, uh, linking cohorts to the health systems data. So I'll turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, John. And thanks, Philip, uh, for uh, the um opportunity to present today. I think you're controlling the slides or our lab or someone is. Uh, so I'm hoping she's gonna bring them up. Um, have I got that right or was? I'm not sure if our lead is there. Yeah, I'll just, I'll have them up in one second. Okay, terrific. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna speak about is uh, the, the linkage of CANPATH to uh, Health Data Research Network Canada or also sort of known as the Canadian, SPORE Canadian Data Platform, and they really are one and the same. Um, so Health Data Research Network Canada is a newly constituted national organization uh, that is made up of, uh, of all of the various partners um, in HDRN and who are also part of the SPORE Canadian Data Platform. So these, this initiative is funded by the CIHR. It's a seven-year grant to, to create a national platform uh, for distributed analytics, and um, our, our aim was essentially, the aim of the, uh, of the entire initiative is really to make it easier for Canadian researchers uh, to undertake multi-jurisdiction research in Canada, because we know that it's, there, are, there are challenges within jurisdictions for sure, um, but even more so when you're trying to carry out population level or, or, or large-scale uh, research uh, across multiple jurisdictions in, in Canada. So the purpose of this is to create a platform to enable that. And very much like CANPATH, while there are many, many researchers involved in HGRN and the Canadian Data Platform and um, uh, research organizations from across Canada, the purpose of this really is to, is to create infrastructure to support your research, to support the research communities opportunities to access and undertake analyses and research with data. So um, the, the, the partners that are involved in H HGRN are organizations like ICES in Ontario that you may be familiar with. Uh, we're a health services research institute that has relatively routine access to population level administrative health data for Ontario. And there are similar organizations across, uh, in most provinces in Canada, who are part of HGRN, groups like the Manitoba Center for Health Policy in Manitoba, um, uh, Pop Data BC in, in British Columbia, and so on, uh, Spore Data Platforms uh, in Alberta uh, and Quebec and, and, and the Maritimes. 
as well uh, as including uh, two national organizations, so CAIHAI and CICAN are both partners in the initiative. So we're all working together to try to create, or to, and we have created the Canadian Data Platform uh, to support access to uh, our data assets for the research community to support multi-jurisdictional research. One of the things that we wanted uh, that, that was very much in scope and, is, and part of our vision was to support, uh, was to link cohorts into the, our data environment, cohorts like the CanPath data. So we've been talking to Philip and John and their team now for a couple of years around how to make this happen. And it's very exciting that we're now talking about this as a, as a reality. So maybe we go to the next slide. Um, I'll just talk to you a little bit about how, uh, about HGRN Canada. Um, I think oh, that's bringing it up here. Right, so, um, so the, the, the organ, and, and specifically around COVID-19, since that's sort of the topic of the day today. So similar to CanPath, when COVID-19 struck, uh, we immediately looked to what resources we could bring to bear, what data resources and other resources we could bring to bear uh, to address the COVID-19 uh, question. And there is a website, uh, uh, the HGRN Canada uh, website has information on these resources, so you're welcome to take a look at that. But essentially, a number of uh, provinces uh, uh, already have COVID-19 test result data available for research purposes. Um, and uh, those include Ontario, uh, where we uh, have access COVID-19 test results that can be linked with all of the other data assets we have, and as well with uh, the uh, Ontario Health Study uh, in Ontario. But similarly, the CanPath cohorts in those jurisdictions that have COVID-19 test result data could be linked for analytics around uh, COVID positive status and uh, all of the other data that CanPath has, and of course, all of the other data that's available to uh, researchers. Um, we expect that over time, the data that relates to COVID-19 is going to increase in the uh, in the partners that make up HDRN, and so stay tuned as those uh, uh, research um, assets grow. Um, we, we also have a single portal called the DASH, or the Data Access Support Hub, which is where a researcher can go uh, to understand what data uh, um, uh, resources are available across the HDRN platform, and which could also provide information around linkage to CANPAP. So, I mean, in a way, you could sort of think of, from a researcher's perspective, to, you could either do it, in, a, in you could either start in the CANPAP portal or you could start in the DASH portal. And right now, I think uh, uh, our, our effort uh, in, as we're working together is to make that as seamless as possible for research, researchers. But I think if the primary focus is on CanPath data, you're probably best to be starting with the CanPath portal. Um, so right now, the, the, the DASH is supporting researchers who are interested in, in COVID-19 uh, projects. We already have supported about five COVID-19 related research projects uh, uh, that, that researchers have brought to us. And as I said, our um, uh, data assets are growing and you should take a look at the website and, and updates on what data is available uh, as that uh, progresses. Uh, next slide, please, Arlette. One thing just to, to make clear is that um, by virtue of some of our data access uh, uh, legislation and regulations in, in each of the jurisdictions, the HDRN can't change the rules around data access that exists in each jurisdiction. So what we're trying to do is make, to make it as easy as possible to navigate those rules for researchers. But it does mean that to access data that has been linked to administrative data in one of our centers, you'll be working through those centers for access to, to that data. And I'll let, maybe if we can just bring up the last slide. Okay. Um, so. Again, in terms of facilitating multi-jurisdictional uh, research uh, uh, between uh, CanPath and HDRN. Um, okay, we just lost that slide. The pleasure of Zoom calls. Um, so, uh, yes, so interested researchers are invited to submit requests um, uh, using CanPath data through DASH. This is the website um, for uh, our data access support hub. It also has information on the COVID-19 data um, that we have available. 
you, it's a fairly simple process to create an account and navigate. There are real people on the other end of this, so you won't be talking to a bot or just getting um, uh, sort of standard emails back to you. There's the option to speak to staff uh, that can support uh, requests and, and enable you to understand the processes uh, and what data is available within each jurisdiction. Um, and we will coordinate uh, consultations between you as a researcher and individual uh, um, uh, data centers as well as with CANPATH as, uh, in order uh, to undertake this, this work. And I just wanna make sure to kind of repeat, and it's, you see in the, in the asterisk at the bottom, that this is a distributed network model, and the uh, re requests that we receive have to follow the existing approvals processes and procedures that exist within each jurisdiction. So it's not as though there, we can make those rules and processes go away. What we can do is provide a sort of concierge service to enable you to, uh, to navigate them more effectively. And so I think with that, I'll stop and turn it over to uh, Arjun. So thank you, Michael. And um, Arjun, welcome. I, I did the introductions, but I think at the very beginning, you might not have heard that I've already uh, pointed people to the written bio, but I, I do thank Arjun Siddiqui for also joining us and having some verbal, uh, some uh, discussion of uh, all of the previous content. So over to you, Arjun. Thank you. Thanks, John. And am I right that we're ending at one? Okay, I'm going to do this really quick then. I'll do an abbreviated version so that other people can get a word in. Um, so thanks very much for having me, John, Arlette, uh, and the panelists. I really appreciate it. Um, I think what I'll do is just sort of cut to the chase. Uh, and that is to say that even though COVID is something that you can acquire just from being in close proximity to people who have it. Uh, and, and therefore you get this impression that there could be, you know, sort of varying risk factors indeed, but that it's something that you imagine would be sort of socially ubiquitous. Nonetheless, we found these inequalities. Uh, there was an ICES report and of all the social factors, uh, I think racialized, uh, living in a racialized neighborhood had the highest risk, higher than income in fact. And so we're seeing really strong racial disparities in COVID uh, from US data, from UK data, and to some extent from Canadian data where we uh, have it, though we need much more of it. Why is this the case? Well, we think it's because uh, people who are uh, black and brown are more likely to be in what have been deemed essential service jobs, jobs that are in front frontline work, long-term care workers, grocery clerks, transit operators, and so on. And so the risk of infection becomes higher. On top of that, there are other dynamics happening. Uh, for instance, uh, black and brown people are more likely to be low income and therefore live in more crowded uh, housing, crowded apartment buildings where there's less oversight about common spaces and, and physical social distancing in those spaces. Um, I could go on about what the risk factors are, but nonetheless, they all seem to come back to um, some fundamental inequalities. And as many of you know, this is unsurprising. We see uh, racial inequalities and other socioeconomic inequalities in almost every outcome of which we know. Um, and so maybe what I'll do is just say a little bit about how I perceive CANPATH being able to tackle this. So from what I can tell, um, I think uh, the racial ethnic inequality component will not be something that CANPATH will on its own be able to um, uh, sort of comment on. Uh, I didn't see race ethnic data being collected by uh, uh, the CANPATH project. And therefore it's a little bit of a limitation that you have um, no data on what is emerging as the main uh, inequality in COVID. On the other hand, um, my sense is that because there is data on economic inequality, uh, at things like income and job conditions, combined with some of the sort of um, mechanistic information about mask wearing and so on and so forth, social distancing, that will get at the mechanisms through which racial inequalities are operating but it's not the same as understanding what the fundamental inequality, for instance, by race, ethnicity looks like. And 
unfortunately, it's not enough to substitute economic inequality as a way to understand racial inequality. Certainly, a big part of how racial inequality manifests is through economic inequality. Um, but you really want to know, number one, who's affected by the economic inequality, and that's where race ethnicity comes in. Um, and you also want to know if there's other pathways through which this is operating independent of economic inequality or intersecting with it. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Those are uh, important uh, comments, Arjuman. Thank you. Um, I, I observed that there were quite a few um, questions that were posted on the, uh, the Q&A feed, and those actually have been addressed. So I think that in a way, the um, the, what each of you have said as discussants. I think it's open for uh, response, maybe by Philip or others could ask other questions, but even the points that um, Dr. Siddiqui has just uh, raised. Um, Philip, do you have any comments to that point? You're on mute. Sorry, I didn't have control of the mute. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Siddiqui, is there, so I'm just going to ask this really quickly then, uh, from the CANPATH perspective, is there a way that we could be addressing the types of issues that you've been, that you've highlighted more directly with our, with what we're doing in the field presently? Sorry, I was muted too. Yeah. Um, if there was an opportunity to collect race ethnic data, that would go a very long way. And in the absence of that, being able to link to um, census level race ethnic um, data. So for example, uh, you know, you have the, the data I saw on um, density, and I'm assuming you're getting some of that from census sources. Did I miss that? Well, our participants actually provide us with information about where they live and we yeah. get updates from them about residential histories. Yeah. And we actually do, we do capture self-declared ethnicities at, at varying resolutions, um, uh, depending on what people are telling us in terms of information. So um, if you have where they live, you can likely connect that to sense a bunch of different census variables that will speak to the social and economic characteristics of their neighborhoods. It's not the same thing as understanding um, their individual um, uh, social and economic characteristics, though there is some correlation between the two. Um, but if you do have individual level race ethnic data, I think it would be really interesting to know, for example, um, given a particular income level, what is the uh, kind of uh, disparity you see across race ethnic groups? Because I think one of the things that's emerging is that, yes, this is about income, but in particular, it's about income and jobs that are concentrated in black and brown communities, for instance, long-term care work. So I think if you have some of those indicators, there is, there is something you can do in connection with the other data um, that you have that would be really productive and would actually really speak very nicely to some of the discourses that are happening um, internationally around, around COVID inequities. If, if I can add one clarification, um, we circulated the COVID questionnaire beforehand and for the audience to know too that that COVID questionnaire that went out during the pandemic just recently did not include information about race ethnicity However, that was obtained at baseline and earlier, and it was not felt to be something that was changing as rapidly as other dimensions. So race ethnicity is in, information is available, but the updated socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic was one of the reasons why that was much more fully explored in the COVID questionnaire. Your points are very well point made though, uh, Arjuman, for example, how population cohorts of this type can really address these big questions. There's a further refinement of method and further recruitment that's possible, that sort of thing. But um, right now it would be, these things would be doable, but they could be improved. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point. And I think cohorts like this have something that the large population data sets don't have, for instance, um, the, the administrative data that's collected by government, which is fine grain information about detailed information about biology, about um, behaviors that will tell us a little bit about how mechanisms operate. Thank you. John, there was one question about Kaihai, and I wanted to know if uh, Michael could address that. That's possible. There was a question as to whether uh, the cohorts were being linked to Kai Hai. So Kai Hai is part of HDRN. So if if it's uh, if the if um, it would be certainly feasible to 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 do that linkage. But um, if we're talking about CanPath cohorts, my understanding, uh, and maybe Phil can answer this, is that the, the linkage of it has occurred within each pro pro provincial jurisdiction, and I don't believe there's been a linkage at Kai Hai. But there's no reason that that's not possible. Um, in most cases, um, the data that Kaihai has is also available within our uh, individual provincial centers. However, if somebody wanted to undertake a national analysis uh, and all of the data, all the linked data that they needed was available in Kaihai, it, it might be more efficient to, to link the CanPath data at Kaihai. But actually, I turn that back to Philip. I, I don't know if that's in scope or not, Philip. For linking the various CanPath cohorts to uh, directly to Kaihai. Yeah, we, we've recently done an evaluation with Kaihai um, about uh, how we can do linkages at the regional level. And I, I fully agree, Michael, it might be the most reasonable way is that if there are some consent issues in terms of how Kaihai information could be released, um, it's not necessarily that it would have to be released, but it could be addressed or uh, researched through the HDRN activity because all of that's, I believe all of that information is within HDRN. Right, so, so that's very much the HDRN model. If, if we just put CanPath aside for a moment, if a researcher came in and had a question that they could answer with just data that's housed at Kaihai, then the analysis would just take place there in a pooled environment and that's great. Um, if, if it couldn't, if it requires additional data that Kaihai doesn't have, uh, then it would take, take place in the individual uh, centers in a distributed fashion. Thank you. I, I think uh, there's there's one outstanding question that we'll uh, directly respond to uh, to the um, um, requester. But I, in the interest of time, I would just really like to thank um, each of you as presenters uh, for your thoughtful um, review and presentation today. Um, and I thank all of the participants for joining us today. There, um, any other information, uh, please uh, follow up with uh, the folks at CanPath directly and we'll try to answer all of your questions. And um, again, to each of the presenters, thank you very much and um, we'll sign off for now, but good day y'all, bye-bye. Thank you everyone.